We've been working to provide alternative economic, industrial and legal system and one that workers deserve. One that will treat them better, one that recognises and acknowledges the work that they do and the contribution they make to society and one that will give them a voice not only in the workplace but in Parliament and will put money in their pocket. So in 2013, the Institute put out a manifesto for collective bargaining. That's when we started in 2013. In 2016, we produced our manifesto for labour law. In 2017, we informed the very popular and um, uh, informative Labour Party manifesto called For the Many, Not the Few. And in 2018, now, we are here to launch our next publication, as I say, rolling out the Manifesto for Labour Law. We started with 15 experts working with us, given of their time free and their knowledge and understanding of labour law uh, in support of workers and the trade union movement. <coughs> Many other organisations took up those ideas, some even acknowledged that they'd taken them from us, others just used them, that's fine. Last week the IPPR put out a document, many of its proposals could have been written by our experts and very good they were too. Uh, more importantly, the Labour Party, and I must say John MacDonald in particular, uh, welcomed our manifesto as a blueprint for a forthcoming Labour government um, to enact Labour law uh, policies. It was also taken up by the Greens, by the SNP and by others. We recognise that the free market has failed, austerity has failed, change is coming and workers deserve better. So, with the Labour Party's encouragement, we developed the ideas in our first manifesto and develop them into policy proposals in our rolling out and that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Rolling out involves five working groups of specialists so we cover everything from the Ministry of Labour, from sectoral collective bargaining, health and safety, equality, a whole range of employment law issues that we think an income and government ought to introduce to better protect workers and their trade unions and work. I'm going to sit down because there are people here who um, can tell you more, uh, can welcome the report, can support the report, and can say why their unions and they are supporting what we have offered to people to take forward as uh, a new government comes in. So the first speaker I'm going to introduce tonight is one of the authors of the report, uh, John Hendy. Um, John is the chair of the Institute of Employment Rights. He has well, obviously, been involved in this project right from the start. He authored with Keith Ewan the manifesto. He has now uh, authored this one too. I should say too, Keith Ewan can't be with us tonight, which is a shame, but he's got a family commitment up in Scotland, so, uh, but he sends his best wishes. So, can I welcome first to speak John Hendy. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. This is a very technical document, it, it sets out what legislation is necessary to do the things that it describes in there. How to get rid of zero hours uh, contracts, how to have a universal status for workers that covers all workers and gives all workers all rights from employment rights from day one. It sets out the mechanism by which a Labour government could set up a Ministry of Labour. It deals with the changes necessary to have a really effective equalities law, the changes necessary for health and safety legislation, uh, and in particular, it deals with what is necessary to restore sectoral uh, collective uh, bargaining. Now, that's the subject that I want to talk to you about tonight. Let me just say a word about the, <coughs> the technicalities of that. What we, have in, what we envisage is a collective bargaining act which will give the Minister of Labour the power in a sector of industry to establish a national joint council consisting of equal number of representatives of the workers on one side and the employers on the other and that national joint council will set minimum terms and conditions for that sector of industry. It's not going to happen overnight, but what we propose is 
that sector after sector after sector should be identified by the minister, the NJC set up, and after uh, several years, we anticipate that at least 90% of the working population, 32.34 million people in Britain, will be covered by uh, an NJC setting up minimum terms and conditions for that particular uh, industry. <coughs> and we propose that, whatever the terms and conditions are negotiated and agreed by the NJC should then be binding on every employer in that sector and on every worker in that sector, whether they're self-employed, directly employed, agency staff, temporary workers, or whatever. That's the mechanism, essentially. I know our enemies are going to say, well, this is a present for the trade unions. Well, in a sense, of course, it will be beneficial for trade unions. But let me make it absolutely clear. There's also a huge task here for the TUC and for the trade unions, particularly in sectors where there is very little trade union organisation. And these are the sectors that are crying out for a national joint councils, sectors like the catering industry that we're going to hear about later, sectors like social adult care, sectors uh, and other sectors of, of that kind. So there's going to be a, a huge amount of work for trade unions to organise workers, organise representation and make sure that they're speaking for an actual constituency to whom they are uh, answerable when negotiations go on at the NJC. So enough about the technicalities. In front of this audience it would be absurd for me to tell you why sectoral collective bargaining is a good idea. Everybody now accept, ac accepts that. But what I thought might be useful was if I were to give reasons why we, or arguments that we could take to the electors of this country to convince them that this is a feasible, necessary, essential part of the policies of the Labour Party and why people should be, vote Labour at the next election. So uh, colleagues of ours in the Institute of Employment Right, or a colleague, Lydia Hayes, wrote a booklet called Eight Good Reasons Why Adult Social Care needs sectoral collective bargaining. I'm going to give you seven tonight. The first is to restore democracy at the workplace. Everybody knows that the only way in which workers' voices can be heard at the workplace is collectively through collective uh, bar bargaining. Collective bargaining in this country was at the level of 86% in 1976, before the Tories' 40 years of neoliberalism. 86%, which means more than 8 out of every 10 workers had the benefit of a collective agreement at work. That percentage now is only a little over 20%. The business, the BEIS department, claims that it's 26%. I don't believe that. It's just over 20%, which means that only two workers out of every 10 have the benefit of a collective uh, agreement. <coughs> and we all know what that means. It means that employers unilaterally decide the terms and conditions of, of work, and workers, people seeking work, are offered work on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. They have no say, no input, no chance to negotiate, no... Uh, a possibility of bargaining those terms and conditions, they're simply uh, told that if they don't like it, they can go and get a job somewhere else. I did a case last year involving Deliveroo cycle uh, riders. We took it to the CAC. We were claiming that the Deliveroo riders in Camden and uh, in Ca the London Borough of Camden should be entitled to collectively bargain their terms and conditions. We failed in that argument. We're now taking it on, on appeal. We see what luck we have with the High Court judges. But we failed on that. We failed because 
the CAC, the Central Arbitration Committee that decides these things, held that we weren't real, uh, we weren't w w workers within the definition. Why weren't we workers? Well, because there was a right of substitution in the, in the contracts, which meant that riders could sub engage a substitute to carry out their work. Of course, it was fantasy. These riders never engaged su substitutes. But the significance of it is not just what you've read in the paper about that case. The significance of it is that the employers inserted that clause in those contracts a week before the hearing in the CAC. And they inserted it without any consultation of the workers, without any chance of the workers saying, hang on a minute, we don't want substitutes. Or even if we do, we don't like the way that you phrase that. Can we renegotiate it? Not at all. It was imposed upon them. And that is an example which everybody in this room knows is commonplace in uh, industry uh, today. So we want to restore uh, democracy at the workplace. Secondly, we want to redress the imbalance of power at the uh, workplace. Of course we accept management must have the right to manage. We understand that. But subject to the right of the workers to negotiate and their terms and conditions of uh, employment. This is about freedom of association, which as a lawyer I understand because it's a fundamental human right. It protected by Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Everyone has the right to freedom of association, including the right to join a trade union for the protection of his interests. Word, gender specific words, it was written in 1950. We understand what it means though. This is about freedom of association. It's about restoring dignity instead of deference. It's about restoring solidarity instead of subservience at the workplace. That's what collective bargaining, sectoral collective bargaining is about. Thirdly, it's about reducing inequality at work. We, are, we know that we are, while winning this argument, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development publishes a report every year called Economic Outlook. Economic Outlook 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18 have <coughs> extensive chapters devoted now to the benefits of collective bargaining. Why capitalism needs collective bargaining. We're winning that uh, argument and the inequalities that we have to address are well known to everybody. Of our workforce, the median wage as of April this year was £23,200 a year. That means 50% of our workforce, over 16 million people, earn less than £23,200 a year. And 20% of them, that's over 6 million people, earn less than £15,000 a year. And we know what company directors are earning 120 times, CEOs of the top 100 companies, earning 120 times the earnings of their average uh, 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 workers. There are more workers, there are more people receiving state benefits who are in work than there are out of work. The proportion of wages against profits in this country has fallen from 65.1% going to wages in 1976 down to 49.5% in 2017. That's a 15.5% of gross domestic product which has been taken out of the pockets and the wallets of working people and put into the profits of those that own uh, uh, industry. And we know, of course, that the real value of wages has not risen since 2003. Economic inequality is a major problem, and sectoral collective bargaining is a way to redress that. All the e economic research uh, demonstrates that. And of course, it's not just between the rich and the poor. We're also talking about disparities in the gender pay gap, 
disparities between the pay of, of workers who ought to be receiving equal pay for, equal, uh, for work of equal uh, value. Fourth reason. Sectoral collective bargaining prevents bad employers from undercutting good employers by using cheap labour. That's because sectoral collective bargaining sets the rate for the job. And that means that the parties of the far right will be deprived of one of the arguments that has stimulated xenophobia and racism in this country. That is the argument that foreign workers are coming here taking British people's uh, jobs. It, that argument will simply will not wash because employers now cannot select cheap labour from Eastern Europe or anywhere else. They will have to pay the rate for the job regardless of nationality or ethnic origin or colour or, uh, or uh, uh, gender. So the effect of uh, the prevention of undercutting means that employers will have to compete on investment, on research, development, on efficiency and on uh, productivity. The fifth reason, and probably this is the one that uh, appeals to ordinary people most, is that collective bargaining, sectoral collective bargaining, increases wages. This is the union premium. Everywhere in the world, people who are union members, on average, earn more than those who are not. Why is that? It's because union members predominantly have the benefit of collective bargaining because collective bargaining drives wages up. Of course, we accept that many employers don't want wages to rise, but employers as a whole receive a benefit because increased wages on a national basis stimulates demand in the economy. It increases demand, and that's because, of course, working people spend their wages, whereas rich people stick it in bank accounts in the Cayman Islands. So the increase in wages, the stimulus in the economy has other benefits as well. It reduces the amount of state benefits that government has to spend to prop up low wages. It increases the tax take of government as workers rise through the uh, uh, tax uh, bar barriers. And it's this reason, the need to increase wa wages, that of course stimulated uh, the growth of collective bargaining all around the world in the 1930s. So the sixth and penultimate reason I want to put before you is the, that the sectoral collective bargaining that we're proposing will cover any subject that workers wish to negotiate with their employers. We're not just talking about under the recognition machinery, pay hours and holidays. We're talking about anything that the workers wish to raise. And in our booklet, we've proposed that the minister should require 41 separate uh, uh, subject matters for mandatory negotiation. Of course, the employers and the workers may not agree on those things. Some of them may, there be, may well be a failure to agree. But 41 matters we think that these NJCs should attempt to negotiate and have on their agenda. I can't go through all of them, but I'll just mention two, if I may. One is the forms of employment. Why shouldn't the National Joint Council for the Catering Industry discuss the extent to which it will permit agency workers or flexible workers on so-called zero-hour <laughs> uh, uh, contracts or the extent to which self-employment will, will be uh, permitted? That's something that should, could, it could be uh, a subject for negotiation. And the other example I just wanted to put before you is a major looming problem for industrial relations in this country, and that is the advance of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, robots. We all know that this is a threat to jobs, but how is it to be resolved? The only way it can be resolved is that 
artificial intelligence should diminish <laughs> the working hours of, of people so that they have more time for the other aspects of life other than work. Well, if that's the solution, it seems a bleeding obvious one to me, if that's the solution, that will have to be negotiated. And these NJCs are the place where such negotiations should take place. And finally, uh, the seventh uh, reason that I suggest that working people in this country should vote for a party which supports the rollout of sectoral collective bargaining is the one that's closest to my heart as a lawyer. It's because international law, international treaties, which the United Kingdom has ratified and by which it's bound, <coughs> require that this state, like any other ratifying state, promotes collective bargaining. Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 6 of the European uh, Social Charter, Convention 98 of the ILO, and so on and uh, so forth. This is a legal requirement that we are proposing that the Labour Party uh, should uh, adopt. So for all those reasons, I think we've got the material here to go out to the electorate and say, these are things that we could vote for if there is a party who will uh, uh, promote them. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much for that, John. Um, a great overview of uh, the main part of our manifesto on sectoral collective bargaining. I should point out that we want any government to do this, just so ha we have to say that because we keep getting into trouble with the Charity Commission. So anybody can adopt it, but it's obviously clear that they're only going to be introduced by a progressive government, and for that we look towards um, the election of a Labour government sooner rather than later. So with that in mind, I'll invite our next speaker on to speak, and that is John MacDonald, Shadow Chancellor. John. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, I apologise, I've got to rush off for a train soon after speaking. Um, but I wouldn't have missed this fringe for the world because I, over the years, I've come to the fringe meeting um, as a, an activist, as a Labour MP, and now as Shadow Chancellor. And my job over the years is to come back and give a political report back on where we're at because over the years, I've, and I declare an interest here as well. I'm Secretary of the, um, the Ewing, Hendy and Jones fan club because I've worked with these people over the years and the work they've done, I just think the movement has to congratulate them, not just the quality. <laughs> the quality of the work has been superb. It's been an unarguable case as far as I can see. But what they used to do is draft up on an almost annual basis um, Freedom of Trade Union bill that I'd be sent into Parliament to argue. It was like being in the trenches and going over the top at times. And we won the argument, never really got the votes, and that was even in the Labour Party, I have to say. We're in a different situation now, absolutely different situation. But I think Cal is right, because I think the atmosphere has changed dramatically, not just within the Labour Party, but within wider society as well. Cad was quoting the FT, and she said, reading the FT, interesting. Dennis Skinner reads the Morning Star, the FT, and the Daily Telegraph. And I asked him why the FT and the Daily Telegraph. He said, I read the Morning Star to discover what the happened in the movement, disputes, etc., and the FT and the Telegraph, because I want to know what the enemy are thinking as well. <laughs> it's interesting, right the way across the piece. Now, we've been doing meetings right around the country, economic seminars, opening up to the general public, public meetings, etc., the mood has dramatically changed. Eight years of austerity and people have had enough. And the levels of insecurity are remarkable. And it isn't just Deliveroo drivers or TGI Friday or McDonald's workers or zero-hour <coughs> contract workers. Yes, all of them have got a level of insecurity that actually we've not seen since the 1930s and my father and granddad would queue on the docks at Liverpool to see if they got work that day. Yes, that's come back in certain sectors. But what's interesting is the insecurity that is in other sectors now that thought they were secure. And that includes education. It includes various professions that they thought would never happen to them. But as a result of austerity now, there's a depth of insecurity where people want radical change. 
and they want radical change fast as well. Let me just tell you where we're at. I, I think now we could have a general election at any point in time. The, I've, up until now, I've been a pessimist, thinking these toys will cling on to office for as long as they can, right up to 2022. It's clinging on to office, it's not clinging on to power, because literally they can't get stuff through Parliament because they're disagreements amongst themselves. And also with regard to the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went through a period of industrial action like this. <laughs> My view is this: they're trying to try and cling on to office. They're not in power. But either this autumn or next spring, we could be in a situation where they rip themselves apart, and we have to be ready. Then we have to be ready for taking over and going into government as a Labour Party. I just say this: in the dispute, the, the debate around Brexit, etc. So one of the reasons I'm arguing now that actually, yes, there's arguments for a people's vote possibly as one of the options. What I want, though, is a general election. I don't want to let them off the hook. I want them to clear up once and for all. I want them to move over so that we can come to government or fail in that a general election. And when we go into that general election, we're now in a situation where we're having to prepare for power rapidly. And the job that we're doing now, and Becky Long-Bailey will take you through it, we've also got one of our colleagues, one of her team here, Chia and Wara. What we're doing at the moment is literally looking at every commitment we gave in the last manifesto and then see whether or not it stands the test of time, whether or not it needs to be radicalised as well, turning those commitments, those individual policies, into implementation manuals and then getting the draft legislation on the shelf. So when that election comes, we want to hit the deck running. And the debate, well, that's an intensive amount of work that's going on that Becky's leading on in this particular field, in this particular area. And I tell you, when you look back in 10 or 20 years' time, whatever, you'll remember the name of Becky Long-Bailey because she's the woman that is going to revolutionise trade union rights in this country. <laughs> so we will, we're now in that situation of selecting from the priorities that are coming forward in those discussions that first Queen's speech alongside that first budget. And the argument that many are putting up in the debate around the Queen's speech is we've got to do something rapidly within that first period which actually tackles the real issues people are facing. And it's so popular, so popular, it will stand the test of time. We hegemonise the debate. And some of us are arguing one of those issues will be this, the restoration of trade union rights and then taking them so much further. And that's one of the reasons we asked the IER, we asked Keith and we asked John and we asked Caroline, could you prepare us the, basically the manual that we need? And I think this plus the previous document is as close to that manual as we could get. We, this document will provide us, to, well, with the basic tools in which we can go in, hand to the civil servants in the preparation for government, and they will then know what we need. And what's interesting about it as well, the detailed work that's gone on. Keith Ewing is the first person who advised us. Actually, you don't need legislation, primary legislation, to set up the new department that we want. We can use the powers of prerogative, which we will do. Where we do need legislation, the Collective Bargaining Act, to make sure that we roll out Collective Bargaining, we can start drafting that now and have it ready for the, on the shelf to enable that to happen. And that's what we'll do, roll out sectoral Collective Bargaining. The discussions that we can have now in preparation is how do we define those sectors? How will that go into the legislation itself? Then we can go further in terms of the discussions. And some of this is straightforward as well. In that first clean speech, we can say trade union rights will fulfil the promise of John Smith from day one. We're going to introduce legislation rapidly to enable that to happen. Access to work for workplaces for trade unions so that they can ensure that people have a voice and they can engage with that discussion about recruitment itself as well. All of those individual issues, I think, we're able to do fairly rapidly. What will that do? It will immediately, alongside our commitment to a real living wage, immediately it will start putting money in people's pockets. It will enable people then to lift themselves out of the, well, in many instances, poverty that they're now living in. What is staggering, you know, we sit opposite these Tories, and they keep on coming back time and time again to say how many wonderful new jobs they've created. Then we point out to them the near million of people on zero-hours contracts, the insecurity that they are, and the fact these jobs are so good 
uh, two-thirds of our kids living in poverty are in families where someone's at work. What does that say? That say there's a plague of low pay that we've got to tackle. And if we can, my view is, if we can get this, these proposals in place very quickly in the first Queen's speech, we can start lifting people out of poverty very rapidly. But to be frank, I'm a Benite. I believe what Tony Benn said back in the 1980s, what our objective is. It's about an irreversible shift in wealth and power in favour of working people. But that actually, to implement that, we also need an irreversible shift of wealth and power and ownership. Because with ownership comes the power and with ownership comes the fairer distribution of wealth as well. And that's why we said it does mean, yeah, we're going to go through, we're going to take rail back into public ownership. We're going to bring Royal Mail back into public ownership. We'll do it with water as well. Why? Because we don't want people being ripped off the way that they're being ripped off by privateers and profiteers at the, is at the moment. But we want to go further than that. We've said, with discussion with the cooperative party, we'll double the size of the cooperative sector. So workers themselves will own their sectors, their individual companies, etc. I think it's a timid commitment. We should go much further than that. And today we've started the consultation about another proposal whereby actually companies will be forced to start distributing shares to their workers, not individually, but on a collective basis. And over time, increasingly, those workers within those companies will come to own that company. And that will give them the security of protecting their jobs, but also having that influence and voice on the development of the company's policy and the protection of their pension funds as well. In that way, this is a simple method. We're democratising our economy. We're democratising in a way which will tackle the grotesque inequalities that we now face. I think that will be incredibly popular when we go out on the streets in the next general election itself. I think it will build up a head of steam to enable us to go into office. But more importantly than that, not just winning the election, I think it will sustain us in office as well. And we know as well as I do that when we go into government, there will be quite significant opposition to us from different parts of the establishment. By building up a popular manifesto, implementing it within the first Queen's speech some of the most radical ideas, particularly those ones about ensuring that people are protected at work, that they have a right at work, that they have a democratic say at work, I believe it will sustain against any opposition that the establishment throws us. We'll then lay the foundations in that first term of a Labour government for the second term of a Labour government, and we'll go further ensuring that we have that democratic, equal society that we want. I repeat time and time again what that society will look like. Radically fairer, radically more democratic, radically more equal, based upon an economy that's prosperous, but economically and environmentally sustainable. But the difference between us and the choice will always be that that prosperity will be shared by everyone. I call that socialism. Solidarity. As John says, he has to dash back to catch his train, but you'll all have the benefit of listening to him again on Tuesday when he speaks to Congress, so uh, we look forward to that. Now, John mentioned the um, impact that the current weaknesses in law are having on ordinary workers, and we think it's important that not just politicians and academics and lawyers have a say on our platforms, but that we have a living example of what our workplaces are like at the moment. So I am very pleased to, we to welcome to one of our platforms once again, Lauren Townsend, who is here speaking from the TGI Friday dispute. Welcome. <laughs> So I'm Lauren, I'm a waitress at TGI Fridays and I'm also one of the lead activists on the Fair Tips, Fair Pay campaign that we've been um, having since January. So um, I'm sure many of you know the catalyst for the dispute um, was that in January, with two days notice, we were called into a meeting and told that 40% of our card tips would be reallocated to kitchen teams. Now this is a move that we strongly believe has been made so they don't have to give the kitchen an actual pay rise. Um, and it's resulted in losses of up to £250 a month for wait staff. Uh, some of my colleagues, um, the working mums in particular, have been hit so hard by this change, 
they've actually had to claim benefits for the first time. Um, despite working the same hours they were working last year and despite the minimum wage increase in April. They've always been proud to work to provide for themselves and their children. They've expressed shame and embarrassment and having to claim to make ends meet. This is not okay um, and we continue to say to them, it's not them who should be ashamed. It's the companies paying poverty pay and calling it a living wage who should be hanging their heads and held accountable for the burden their low-paid, exploitative business models place on the state. In regards to the tips, it isn't a matter of not wanting to share, as the company would have the public um, and the media believe. Frankly, we're hurt at that suggestion. We love our kitchen teams. We think they deserve and need a pay rise. We just don't want it to come from our pockets when we already earn so little. If all staff were paid a wage they could actually live on, we wouldn't have to be so reliant on the generosity of our guests to make ends meet. The dream is a world that doesn't require a tipping culture at all, where everyone earns enough from a hard week's work to be able to put a roof over your head, food on the table, pay your bills, you know, God forbid, an annual holiday to Spain. Front of house staff, believe back of house staff, deserve and need more money. But so far, it's been hard to get them on board to fight with us. Um, at the minute, it's front of house staff who are feeling the impact on their pockets. That's why we've been able to unionise and go on strike as we have. Tips were not the first issue we've come up against. Um, we were bought by a hedge fund company about four years ago, and since then, we've noticed cuts. Um, our time and a half was taken over bank holidays, over Christmas and New Year. We lost shift meals. Um, and labour has been cut drastically to the point that I now, on a Saturday night, serve double the tables I would have served eight years ago. We still only have two hands and two feet, and we bust our butts to make sure every guest is given the best po possible experience. We give, 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 but it just seems like in return they take, take, take. Minimum wage has never been something we've necessarily complained about because we make up the money. Most weeks through earning tips, but the way people tip is changing. We're moving more and more towards a cashless society. Um, and legally, we actually only own the cash tips that are given to us. Anything given on card is owned by the company who owns the card machine it's paid on. Um, the hospitality industry know this. Um, and we're increasingly seeing restaurants and hotels use legal loopholes to siphon off tips to save themselves money at the expense of us. Money guests are giving us for us. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing all of it. Um, the biggest danger to society today and that I've seen throughout this dispute is apathy. Um, and that apathy is increasing year on year because young people entering the world of work for the first time literally don't know any better. Um, they only know minimum wage. They only know zero hour contracts. They have grown accustomed to youth rates, um, which can mean some of my colleagues who are 19, 20 earn almost two pounds an hour less than me to do the exact same job, work the exact same hours. Um, I've said it before, their bills aren't any less, their rent isn't any cheaper. If this is how we are gonna treat young people entering the world of work for the first time, what hope do we have that they'll grow into strong adults and stand up for the rights in their future careers? Um, and it's only gonna get worse we need this change now. Like this rolling out the manifesto for labour law is so important. Everything it highlights, the sectoral bargaining, we need it. And I can only talk for the hospitality industry um, and a little bit for retail. But it, it's, it's us at the bottom there, you know, the bottom of the food chain, as it seems society would see, that need this help the most. And we are the industry that is has the least to do with trade unions. We're almost, I think we see ourselves as a hopeless cause and that doesn't have to be the case. Um, we need to know that we deserve better. We deserve more than minimum wage. We deserve more than insecure zero hour contracts. Um, we should know where our money's coming from every week. We work hard. At the end of the day, these restaurants wouldn't be able to run without us. Um, and we are literally treated as though we're disposable. We are told, if you don't like it, go and find a job elsewhere. I've got 100 CVs sat on my desk. We don't need you. Um, it's disgusting. There's little to no trade union education in schools. Um, and I know from the start of this campaign, talking to colleagues, 
most of them had no idea what a trade union was, what a trade union can do. Um, they don't know they've given us the weekends, five day working week, you know, sick pay. And I guess we don't always see a lot of that in the hospitality industry anyway, so that might be something to do with it. <laughs> but if things are going to change, trade unions need to become the norm. I would love to get to a place where when you go in on that first day and sign your contract, you opt in to, you know, I'm going to be a member of a trade union. It's just going to come straight out of my pay. And it should be the norm. Everybody should be doing it because we do need the collective voice. Um, in terms of the strike action itself, the process is really long, scary and drawn out. The company gets told two weeks before the ballot is even happening, which gives them a chance to go into stores and talk staff out of balloting in favour of strike action. In stores like mine, where we know our rights and we're not easily intimidated, that kind of takes, uh, it looks like bribery. I've never seen so many of my colleagues win GoPros and Fitbits as they did in the two weeks leading up to the strike ballot. And in stores where they're not maybe as strong as us in Mil Milton Keynes. Um, we're hearing stories from union members of literal just, just intimidation, being screamed at by their general managers, being pulled into freezers and boiler rooms and said, you know how hard this is making my life, you going on strike. Um, then there's the issue of people being frozen out. Uh, hospitality jobs, I think because of the antisocial hours, you're, they do become your second family. Um, and if you know, some of those managers want to make your life hard, they can. If you're not flavour of the week, they can cut your shifts. They can put you in the you know, sections that don't make as much tips. You, they literally can stop you earning money as, as a punishment for being a union member or for being outspoken. Um, I myself was suspended in July for three weeks because of a speech that I made at Unite Policy Conference. Um, the suspension was eventually lifted and my disciplinary dropped. Um, because they really didn't have anything against me other than the fact that I'd spoken out against the wrongdoings the company were doing to in myself and my colleagues and how we thought we deserved better. If I hadn't have had a supportive family like I do and the support of Unite, I can see how it would have been so easy for me to quit and just go and get another job. And that's what people do. We are losing members every week because they're just giving up the fight because the company just sits it out. They just sit it out and wait. Or if you speak out, they suspend you. And although we're given full suspension pay, it doesn't make up what I would normally earn in a week. I'm not making any tips whilst I'm off suspended. I'm not able to do any overtime whilst I'm off suspended. It is the bare minimum. And if I hadn't have had Unite and my family, I would have had to go get another job. Some of the young mums I work with said to me, I couldn't do what you've done and I would have had to get another job. And it scared them now from speaking out. Um, so yeah, I just want to wrap up by saying labour laws need to change. Um, we desperately need to be able to have a collective voice. It's scary being young in the hospitality industry and thinking your employer knows best. You don't know your employment rights when you go into work. You don't know the breaks you're legally entitled to. You don't know that you're allowed you know, 20 minutes for every six hours you work. And if you don't know these rights and you don't stand mm. up for them, unfortunately, employers are, you know, they've got no scruples. They will just make you work 12 hour shifts. You know, grab, grab some dead food offline if you're hungry. Just work, we're busy. We need, first of all, we need a Labour government to get into power because just from my eight months of running this campaign, it's been Labour councillors on our picket lines and it's been Labour MPs marching with us and tweeting their support. So we need a Labour government in power. Um, and we really do need a manifesto for labour law. We need a collective voice. We need more than the minimum wage. We need a wage we can live on. We need contracts with guaranteed hours. We need to end youth rates, because they are just yeah. disgusting. I can't see how there's still age discrimination in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, I'll finish there. Just, we are planning a National Day of Action on the 4th of October, so keep your eyes peeled on social media. Um, we're going to be having a little bit of a rally, and it would be great to have some of your support there. And it will be across hospitality. <laughs> So, you know, the Weatherspoon strikers, the Mook strikers, the TGI strikers. So, yeah, it'd be great to have some support there. Thank you.
thrown the streets as ever. Can I just say we need you just as much, yeah. if not more, than you need us because yeah, it's young yeah. people and fighting young people yeah. that will keep the movement going. Yeah. And it's not just sexual collective bargaining, but um, preventing victimisation of people who um, speak out about giving you labour inspectors so you don't have to stand up and do all the work yourself. There's a whole load of things in the manifesto that we hope will help you and your colleagues as we move forward. So great to have you on board. So I'm going to move on. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious that we are uh, uh, getting a bit late. Um, Mick is going to speak next, um, and then I'll go to uh, Rebecca and then to Dave. So Mick, over to you. Well, th thanks very much, uh, and I echo those comments. Um, I actually haven't listened to that uh, contribution. Um, I've got nothing but praise um, for what you're doing. Complete and utter respect. Think how lucky I am. Um, I always tell this, well, I don't tell, always tell this story, but I joined a union when I was 18 years of age. Uh, that was 40 years ago. I know it doesn't look like it, but it was 40 years ago. But, um, but, but, the re but the reality was this, 40 years ago, I had to join a trade union. I had to join a trade union, I had to join a pension scheme. 40 years ago, that's in the 70s now, there was 14 million trade unions in this country. I don't know how many workers there was, but there was 40 million trade unionists. And the reason I tell this, connection, make this connection between those sort of simple facts is that, as John said earlier on, 32 million working people in this country. Now, whether they're fully employed, bearing in mind the way the, the, the work is these days, I don't know. But only 6.5 million in a trade union. 6.5 million. And the end result, you've just seen what the end result is. And that means that we do need some fundamental change. Not only at the point that you made, John, about the fact that um, artificial intelligence, new technology, they're reckoning that somewhere a third of those jobs, 10, 15 million jobs are going to go as a result uh, of uh, new, new technology. I mean, if you've got 30 million people paying their taxes and you go down, say, a third, uh, take a third off at 20 million people paying taxes, how are we going to be able to afford uh, education the NHS, and all the other things that our society wants, unless we do something about that in itself. But equally, if we had 30 million people, or 32 million, in a trade union, would we have zero-hours contracts? Would we have bogus self-employed? Would we have uh, the pay attacks on our pensions, our safety, job cuts, all the problems we have? We wouldn't, because we would keep completely organised. And that's the point about this manifesto. The point that's been made, that we embed what we've got into our society and make it sustainable. I mean, Thatcher, when she came in, and, and this is the legacy of Thatcher, by the way, when she came in, she wanted to destroy the trade union movement, got rid of the closed shop on the railways, attack collective bargain, to the extent now we've got six and a half million uh, people in the trade union. And the reality is this, is that means that we have survived as a movement, survived. So she failed, ultimately, in her endeavours. That's the, be the benefit of it, but it's only six and a half million of us, when it should be 30. But to thrive in, as a movement, we've got to make some fundamental changes. That's why this manifesto is important. And there's two areas. Now, you might think, um, here I am, uh, you know, General Secretary of the RMT, railway industry, Trans part of the transparency, where there is a lot of collective bargaining, why would I have to worry about a manifesto like this? And yet there's stories in our own industry where we are collectively strong, which tell you that there's more that needs to be done. One of the stories that's come out of the, uh, the reason why John Major um, privatised, said he's going to privatise the railways and introduced privatisation railways, was to destroy trade unions. Well, it didn't work, did it? It didn't. I mean... We're now getting a situation where they're blaming us for the fur because of the cost of the industry, because of all the, fair, the pay rises we get. So something's going wrong there. You know, Chris Grayling, the Secretary of State, uh, wants to uh, cap our wages. We well, ain't going to get that. We're going to smash his cap. We're going to fight it. But the reality is this. Even within our sectors, Network Rail, they employ someone in the reach of 39,000 directly employed people. But what is not known is they employ... A lot of it on the maintenance and renewals enhancements, somewhere in the region of 50, 60,000 people, not directly, but indirectly through their contract contractors. 
The vast majority of those people are on zero hours and bogus self-employed. And we're finding it tremendously hard to organise and recruit and retain members in that sector, for obvious reasons, for the stories you've just heard. So is it in our interest that we get that sorted? And that's why this manifesto is important. But there's another example. Our seafaring industry. 50 years ago, the NUS, National Youth Seamen, had somewhere in the region of 80,000 members. 80,000, 50 years ago. Today, there's only 8,000 UK seafarers. If anyone wants to understand why we as a trade union opposed to freedom of movement, all you have to look at is what the employment practice in the seafaring industry is. There's 500,000 seafarers in, operating in, in European waters. Only 40% of them are EU nationals. Freedom of movement, a race to the bottom, that's why we need sectorial bargaining. Not only just in uh, the uh, rail industry, but actually in the seafaring industry. And one of the things I was talking to John earlier when I met him was that we need it as a Labour Party manifesto to make sure that we get proper regulation in the seafaring industry. Because they always seem to have a reason to exclude it from things. Always exclude it. And that's the ration, reality is that means we have a race to the bottom and we have the problems that you now see where we've hardly any UK-based seafarers. So it's in our interest, in our movement, in a regu well-regulated, well-organised workforce that we have, an industry that we have, that we have these regulations, that we do change it. But fundamentally, one of the things that John said was really important, I thought. We need to change society. We need to make sure that we thrive in the future. And that means making sure we embed in the society all these fundamental changes. So that it's difficult or near on impossible to undo it. And when you do that, you'll get real redistribution of wealth and you will get real socialism. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for that, Mick. And another union that is fighting its way through, making sure it's looking after its members. Uh, the, the, the guards on the, tra on the trains, uh, a, a, a very good uh, dispute and one that I'm sure that you will win. Um, John McDonald said that Rebecca Long-Bailey will, will be well remembered in the future for the transformation she is going to give uh, to our, uh, labor, our, 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 our workplaces uh, in the future. But we remember her now and we're very grateful for the time and the attention and the detail that she gives to us. Three hours we had a briefing with Rebecca and she'd obviously read the stuff because uh, she asked us very important questions and, and knew all about it and uh, she's taken it all on board and we are very pleased to have Rebecca here with us tonight, so welcome Rebecca. Oh, thanks very much, it's, a, it's an absolute honour to follow such fantastic speakers uh, and I've got a lot to, uh, to follow really. Um, I just want to start by saying that John mentioned that he was the secretary of the John Keith and Carolyn fan club and I'm one of their number one members. Um, I think John, um, Keith and Carolyn have done fantastic work and John's already mentioned the initial publication, the Manifesto for Labour Law, and I have to say that most of what's in that manifesto was in the Labour Party manifesto at the last general election. And now we've gone a step further and we've got the fantastic Chion Wura, who might still be in the room. She's working on industrial strategy as part of the Shadow Cabinet at the moment, creating the jobs of the future. And we've also got Laura Pidcock, who's just had a baby, so she can't be with us tonight, but she's our Shadow Labour Minister. And she's driving forward many of the plans to create the Ministry of Labour to make sure that everything that we've put within our manifesto <coughs> is enforced properly. Now, the world of work has changed dramatically in the last few decades, particularly in the last few years. And over the past three decades, there's been a sharp decline in the share of national income going to wages and a rise in insecure work, low pay, and the worsening of terms and conditions. Now, there's a whole industry, unfortunately, which has exploded to sit alongside this precariat, it's sometimes called, to profit and professionalise insecure work. The rise of the gig economy is talked about quite often, insecure, precarious work with few of the rights and protections afforded to traditional workers. And it's just evidence of just how our economy and our labour market is failing millions of people. So I'm going to get a tissue because I've got a really runny nose at the minute. <laughs> <coughs> what was that about runny nose? <laughs> I've got a stinking cold today, unfortunately. 
But nowadays, the vast majority of workers, and I know I don't need to say this at the TUC conference, they have very little say over their terms and conditions. And now we've got nearly 4 million people, that's one in nine workers, currently in insecure work. Not to mention the figures that John mentioned before about the people who are in work yet relying on state benefits to make ends meet. And as a constituency MP, I've had families come to me where both parents are in full-time work and they've asked me where the nearest food bank is. Now that, in the richest or one of the richest economies in the world, should not be happening. And it's an absolute disgrace. And you've heard the stories. Amazon workers feeling like they have to urinate in bottles because they don't want to take a break. Women being forced to give birth in the toilets of Sports Direct because they're frightened of losing their job. The horrific case of Don Lane, the DPD gig worker, who was frightened to go to a medical appointment and unfortunately died shortly afterwards. And you've heard Lauren's story. Staff being denied tips that are rightfully theirs. It should never be up to an employer to decide who gets the tips at a particular workplace. It's up to the employees themselves. And that's why, as a Labour Party, we stated that we were 100% behind their campaign and we wanted to make sure that all tips went to the employees that were entitled to receive them and that will be a key pledge within the next Labour Party manifesto going forward. But I'm heartened, I have to say, by Lauren and the many of her comrades that are campaigning with her because often it's always said to me, oh, you know, the days of trade unionism are long gone, you know, we don't have these big factories anymore where we've got thousands of workers collectively organising. It just doesn't work in shops, it doesn't work in cafes, it doesn't work in small places. Well, I think Lauren is proving that that um, statement is inherently wrong. And I think we're seeing a new generation of trade unionists now who are educating their peers and showing them that the only way to a decent and quality standard of life and secure pay and terms and conditions is to be a member of a trade union and to campaign collectively in solidarity with each other. Now, trade unions who are essential in tackling insecure work and low pay have been under siege by this government over recent years. We had the Trade Union Act in 2016, just after I became an MP, the biggest crackdown in 30 years on the operations of trade unions and the workers who benefit as being a member of a trade union. And the Labour movement has quite rightly recognised that drastic action is required. We've recognised the fundamental failures within our economy for years. And I'm absolutely clear, as John McDonnell has been today, that radical action will be taken in the next Labour government. And we're currently formulating those plans and going into extreme detail, even down to drafting the relevant pieces of legislation. So when that next gener that general election is called, we will be ready to implement our policies straight away. We set out a 20-point plan in our manifesto, and if you're bored tonight and you haven't read it before, please do have a look at it. Everything from banning zero-hours contracts all the way to making sure that trade unions have access to every single workplace. But importantly, we were committed to sectoral collective bargain, as, is, as has been discussed today by John, and it's a key part of tonight's report. Because for over 60 years, the UK, unlike most other countries in the world had what was known as a Ministry of Labour, an organisation within government that was responsible for enforcing labour rights and making sure that businesses and organisations followed the law to the letter. Now, we've fallen down over the last 30 years. Even the current employment law that we do have isn't being enforced. So David Metcalf, the government's so-called employment czar, stated that publicly a few years ago. He said that the government wasn't even enforcing its own policies and its own laws, let alone developing new ones. And then we had the Taylor Review recently. It was the government's attempt at showing that they were the party of the workers, how they were going to end insecure work and, and completely reformulate the gig economy. Well, it, again, it was rhetoric. The intention might have sounded nice, but it seemed to suggest that there was a choice between <coughs> flexibility and security. And that shouldn't be the case. And that's why the Ministry of Labour will be set up under the Lex, uh, Labour government to deal with these issues. 
Now, the detailed proposals put forward in the IER's report provide a guide for how the new Ministry of Labour will work in practice how it will establish the framework needed to introduce sectoral collective bargaining where it doesn't already exist and how we can over ensure that there's oversight of enforcement. It's going to be crucial, the Ministry of Labour, not least as we leave the European Union as a side issue. I think many of you remember Theresa May saying, you know, when Brexit negotiations started, that Brexit was not going to be an excuse for the government to roll back employment rights. It wasn't going to be a race to the bottom. Well, only this summer, the government produced a round of technical notes. Now, you probably won't have seen this in the press because there were you know, many discussions on many other issues, shall we say. But in those technical notes, the government set out how they were going to deal with a no-deal Brexit. And one of those technical notes related to European works councils. Councils that are set up to bring together workers of a company where the employees are in more than one country within the EU to make sure that they've all got the same terms and conditions and that they can all campaign directly to the management. Well, the government stated quite clearly in this technical note that if there's a no deal, there won't be European works councils and there's no plan to put a similar body in place any time soon. So it's all rhetoric and we know this government's direction of travel and that's why it's so important not just for the Labour Party to adopt this uh, report that's been set out tonight but also for all of us in this room to campaign that other political parties are aware of what's contained in this report because we need to see the biggest revolution in employment law that we've seen in a generation. We know that industry is changing at a faster pace than we've ever seen before and we've got to make sure that as that pace of change takes place we're making sure that our workers are protected and as a result of that change, they enjoy a better quality of life. And that's all I've got to say, other than to say, please read this report tonight if you haven't read it already. And we do commit within the Labour Party to working very closely with the IER over the coming months to make sure that the details in relation to our Ministry of Labour are ready to rock and roll as soon as the next general election is called. Thank you. talk about the importance of taking the arguments out because it'll be around labour law and workplace issues that in the next election I think will uh, and can be won and one union that is taking the campaign out to the public um, is led by our next speaker Dave Ward who is General Secretary of the CWU their campaign on what's it called? For workers. New Deal for Workers, that's the one, is taking it out. There was a big demonstration about it this year. He'll update us, I'm sure, and say something about the manifesto. So welcome, Dave. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing to say is, is that 150 years of the TUC, and in 2018, the British economy, one of the richest countries in the world, the foundation of the economy that we live in at the moment is three things, austerity, insecure work, and in-work poverty. That is what's happening to people like Lauren, my grandchildren, my children, your grandchildren, and many of us uh, and our members who we represent are in the same boat. And I can't see where it's ever gonna get any better unless we bring these things together. It's going to get worse. The gig economy, the future world of work, is a challenge where I'm sick of people talking about how many jobs. You know, it might be a few jobs. They are going to be crap jobs. Make no mistake about it. Unless the trade union movement stands up with these guys, with Labour, we are going to end up in a position where workers, and, it, and it's absolutely fundamental this, we face one of two futures. One future is that companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, they are going to grow in wealth and power beyond any country in the world. <coughs> and they are going to own work in a way that they're just going to hand out. We get the scraps off the table. The other future is what we all came into our movement for, which is to fight for working people. And that's why we say that the number one issue at this Trade Union Congress must be for us to come together to look beyond our own trade unions 
and to fight and deliver a new deal for workers. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Because I think there's three things that you can pull together here. One is the work that these guys do. And I also want to pay tribute, because I know they do a lot of this work in their own time. They haven't got huge resources, and they deserve huge credit for the detail that's in this document. People should take this away and look how much different it would be if we can deliver the labour laws that are in here compared to what we had before. The second group we have to pay tribute to is John McDonnell, Jeremy Corbyn, Becca Long Bailey, and all of those people who stood firm and got behind Jeremy in those two leadership campaigns of the Labour Party. You know, I, I listen to some of these people at the moment who have got one agenda about themselves, who used to be New Labour. And I've sat in front of some of these people when we've been in dispute, and they look down, they look down their nose at people like me and the people we represent. They didn't even really want you in the room. These people, when you go on strike now, they phone you up and they say, where do you want us? But the truth is, they've always been there. They've never not been there. And we owe it to this Labour leadership to get behind these people. And I want to talk about the context of Brexit. I'm going to say this tomorrow because I'm sick and tired of us making Brexit the biggest issue as though, like, you know, we can't do anything in the UK. So we sound like sometimes that we get quite brave when we want to stand up for workers' rights and it's in Europe. Well, we've got to start standing up. If we want a credible position on Brexit, and I'm not saying it is a hugely important issue, I accept that, but if we want to be credible as a trade union movement, we can only do that if we show first that we're willing to come together in the UK and stand up and do something about the employment laws that are there at the moment. So we've got... We have got, and there'll be a motion tomorrow morning, our new deal for workers. We've been banging on about this now for two or three years. We finally got the march, and we had thousands of us out in the street. But it can't end there. We're putting forward a very simple plan that means that all of us in this room, and workers everywhere, we can be out supporting Lauren and other workers in McDonald's and right across the country. A four-point plan. One, we have to agree a common bargaining agenda where we tackle three or four issues. Unions can have their own individual issues. We totally accept that. But there's got to be three or four things that we could bring together as a trade union movement, and every single trade union goes out and bargains for those things with employers and pushes it as far as we can. Two, we've got to start cooperating more in recruiting and organising workers. We go on about competition and how much we don't like it, but we've got to face up to the truth that we've got competition in our own movement for workers. And I've got to say, when there's a union like RMT who are out there all the time, this image of trade unions has got to get back to where RMT are, where CWU are, where Unite are, where other unions are actually taking action. That must be the image that's sold. Not sweetheart deals, and it goes on. So we've got to have cooperation, and we have got to have a charter for cooperation that's a bit like the old brilliant agreement. Not how you resolve disputes between unions who are trying to compete. We've got to work together. The third thing is we've got to have a manifesto. The IER have produced a manifesto, really, on employment laws, on workers' rights, and all of those things. And Labour, to their credit, have taken that on and are definitely going to introduce change in this country. But we've got to have our manifesto as a trade union movement. And the central question that we face is what are we going to do about it? These guys are doing it. Labour are doing it. What are we as the trade union movement going to do about it? And that's the fourth point of our plan. Because we're saying it's about time that we had a day of action in this trade union movement. And if we're going to do that properly, we've got to have an honest debate about that as well. Because I'm not going to stand up there and say, let's have a general strike, which becomes an excuse for people to do nothing. And it won't take off. It might happen if we build, and I'm up for that. But you've got to start building. And we're suggesting, and we'll be up there tomorrow pushing this out again, that 
a day next year, halfway through next year, are you telling me that we can't get every worker to do something with an innovative programme, with social media, with all the things that are at our disposal, to come out and say all the things that have been said here today? What a transformation that would make in this country. Bypass the media, let's get out there and let's get our trade union movement back to the place where it really can say it is the true voice of working people once more. Thank you.